Hey everyone and welcome back to another World of Warcraft video. Today we're going to be diving into one of the end game only zones of this expansion. It is the Maw, and unlike other times we've mentioned the Maw, I don't even have a semi-witty dash lane integration joke to make for a sponsor. So that's a bit sad, but we're going to get into it. And this is actually something I think is pretty darn interesting because really with the Maw, what we kind of noticed is this is a small, I mean, it's kind of a version of a patch zone that's just there at launch. So it really is quite interesting as we as we go through this. Now, what you're going to see is there's a lot of potential for this to be really good. You can also see how Blizzard are really trying to hammer home the theme. This is a dangerous, desolate, horrible place that you are not supposed to be in, right? That's how it's really supposed to feel. So there are some players who maybe will have enjoyed the whimsy of Mechagon or something else who maybe won't feel as home in this one, but certainly as essentially a patch island with its own unique vibe going on. Yeah, it's pretty cool actually having this just be there at launch. And it does feel like a launch version of maybe the sort of zone you'd normally get in a 0.1 or 0.2 patch of an expansion, which is pretty sweet. And this could fit in super nicely with the other just slate of endgame content uh, things to do, right? You've got a variety of different feeling world content really this time, as we've sort of covered in our endgame overview video, which you should really check out as well. So we've played around in the Maw, okay? Blizzard, uh, you know, for the big announcement they did recently, they had an event server, we were on that with an NDA and stuff, which was pretty fun. And that's that gave us a early look at uh, at the Maw, as well as a few other things. Be sure to check out the Soulbind video, as well as, um, that also has got um, some chat from Ian in it as well, because I talked to him too, so check that on the channel as well today. But um, yeah, the Maw. We've been there. What is it like to play? Well, number one, I've got to give you the obvious disclaimer. We obviously had a very early look at it. A huge enough portion of it felt pretty barren, I'll say that much. But where it is populated and where it does feel like, you know, there's just little bits of that are a bit closer to completion, it feels super dangerous. There's a lot of enemies around the place, and uh, when you're going through, you just get this Timeless Isles sort of area, or sort of feel, right? So remember the Timeless Isles, it was kind of subdivided into little sub-zones. You know, you had the bit in the middle, you had the rise, the various different parts of the rise, it was kind of like that. There's very distinct areas within the Maw. They've got distinct enemies that generally will share the same core mechanic. I think that ends up working quite well, actually. Now, there is a decently huge overlap here with the enemies found inside Torghast. So this is, you know, this is something that's kind of interesting, right? It means that, yes, you'll have a lot of experience against the Jailer's forces. When you actually go into the Maw, you'll benefit from your Torghast training. When you do Torghast, you'll benefit from the Maw. It's pretty cool. Now, this mechanical overlap has obviously got upsides and downsides. For some people, it will be boring seeing the enemies, but also there is that sense of mastery to be picked up on over a while as you continually deal with just, you know, the Jailer's army and I'll sort of see how it progresses. And really that's just the regular situation where knowing your enemy's mechanics, paying attention to those mechanics and handling them effectively in game is something that's important to do. And it's also something that's really strong for inducing flow in the player. And like, I don't know about you, but I remember way back in the day when I was on top of that rise in the Timeless Isles, I was grinding out those timeless coins before I knew about the Gulp Frog place. You know, when I would just be there killing a whole bunch of those pretty beefy mobs, I just got into the zone, just got into the flow. And the really, I think for me, the hope is that this will actually be captured when I'm actually playing in the Maw in realistic scenarios and the game's out and I'm on my real character. Now, as for the rares, I'd say they're about as strong and intense as one would expect from a zone like this. You know, they're tanky, they hit pretty darn hard, and their mechanics are simple yet punishing. So it's just that regular situation where if you are actually going in there solo or in a very small group and you don't really have the gear, they might push you a little bit. But once you get good enough and really outplay them, you will do pretty well. Now, there are then lots of incentives to come into the Maw in a group, I would say, just because it is such a hostile zone. So certainly something to think about. If you're a solo player, I mean, you'd certainly want to be in a strong solo class. I could imagine sort of squads from guilds going here to sort of do all of their mod dailies at the same time together. Now, when you are in the mod, you'll notice that you'll just come across loads of items to help you. So there's things like disguises, there's mount transformations, kind of like the ground items that you would find in Najatar. Uh, mobs can also drop the odd consumable. As an example, we found a 10% versatility buff for an hour when we were there. 
then it's also just a decently dangerous zone by itself. There's this bit where you've got these molten giants that are rolling rocks downhill at you, and you might think, oh, that's sort of simple and boring, whatever. But you know what? MMO worlds are often pretty darn static feeling, and I think having more things like that in the world is a really, really good thing. And certainly if I think about Torghast, you know, bits where you've got like axes swinging about the place and those environmental hazards, I thought they were very fun. So it's great to see more of that in this zone as well. And I think the more environmental hazards and stuff like that, the merrier. Now that's not it for uh, for hazards because we do have the Eye of the Jailer to contend with where basically it just ramps up over time. So level one turns on these Soul Seeker mobs, which are basically these sort of like just hostile patrols. And uh, you know, that does mean that there's a decent bit more combat when you're making your way around the zone because of these. And that does just make the whole zone feel pretty hostile. Certainly if you're a WoW player and you don't like fighting things, Eye of the Jailer may not be your favorite thing ever. Now, level two of Eye of the Jailer, once that actually kicks off, that starts to launch a sort of a damage zone projectile thing at you. Now, if it hits you, it does pretty substantial damage and then shackles you to the ground with five pins that you've got to click. And you know, sorry, you click them and you can break away. And uh, you know what? That's actually a pretty fun uh, mechanic to contend with when you're fighting the harder mob. So I think that's pretty cool. Then level three adds assassins that will come in to fight you the next time you enter combat, which again is a pretty good idea actually because if they would just come in randomly, that could be really annoying if you just sat down to eat some food, as an example. But them coming in on your next combat engage, I think that's better because it's something you can play around. So I like how they've implemented that. Then level four makes those assassins elites, so that'll be a bit more dangerous. And then at level five, well, the jailer just starts to suck your health away until you're dead. Yeah, level five basically means it's time to leave. So that's basically that. And this hard cap of the sort of level five Eye of the Jailer debuff, I think that's a smart enough way to make an otherwise arbitrary mechanic kind of feel fitting. Overall, you know, this stuff could do with a bit of work, a bit of tweaking and stuff like that. But the idea is that just existing there gets harder and harder as you go on, but mainly in ways that you can play around, bar, of course, the health draining at the end. And it's basically what the Torments and Torghast were supposed to be, but I think it works better in the Maw because the Maw is just more of an open play area. And I think that adding, you know, some sort of soft limit like this does make it feel like you've got to be more efficient. Go in there, kind of get your grab bag of things you can get, and then sort of get out of there. Now that said, we found, you know, it does apply decently slowly, so it should only really impact people, the level five version, like the people who just want to turbo farm the place, which I don't think is really what Blizzard are going to be wanting you to do anyway. Now, in terms of the content that you do there, well, the daily quests that we saw were basically just a case of go to this area and do some stuff. Now, there was uh, only one daily uh, per day from Venari, so it felt like a brief enough visit to here was all that was really needed. But uh, even doing that one quest did take some care because of the density of the elites. Um, and then, of course, I think there are reasons why your Covenant Sanctum will send you over there. Uh, I think, like, you know, to get the freed souls and stuff like that. But yeah, there's definitely reasons to hang around after you've done your core daily, and that's because of the Stygia currency. Now, this is kind of interesting. You get Stygia from just doing stuff there, right? But if you die, your Stygia cuts in half. Now, you can go back to your corpse and pick it up again. So basically, it's Dark Souls. They've got the Dark Souls thing going on with Stygia. And hey, it works for Dark Souls and Hollow Knight, so why not? It fits the theme of this zone. Now, obviously, that means there's no corpse running here. You actually just spawn at a graveyard, then you've got to make it back to your body, which could be pretty dangerous if you got yourself into a real pickle before you died. And you know what? That's good. It's actually nice seeing death being punished in this way in World of Warcraft. No doubt it will be frustrating from time to time, but I think it could, ma it could make for some real... Uh, let's just say, clenchy experiences when you are in the Maw. And uh, I don't think that's going to appeal to absolutely everybody, but there certainly will be a group of people who will want to be pushing themselves there. And I think it's good that the game supports things like that. And yeah, I mean, uh, a death penalty being in the game that's you know, makes sense for that zone, I think that's actually a good thing. Now, the currency is currently used for just placeholder sort of, uh, like, rewards. Uh, there's one that promises to make traversal easier, a cosmetic upgrade and a Torghast, or a cosmetic pet and a Torghast upgrade. So we don't really know the full scope of it there, but it is possible that this Stygia currency it could be used for a lot of things, right? Unlockables, consumables, stuff like that. And I think things like that have really worked out quite well in the past, because it means that people can see this zone of the Maw, and they can just interact with it in whatever way they want. 
ground, they can sort of, you know, just grow and progress. If they really like that zone, they can start doing those upgrades and focusing that. So I think that could be a really strong thing if they actually implement it right. And overall then, as a bit of an aside, I'd say this just screams of like being a zone that Muffinus will pack full of secrets for people to, uh, to painstakingly hunt for. So I think for the secret finding people, there probably will be a decent amount here, which could be quite fun. And certainly on that, I mean, I, I look forward to seeing if the sort of level five Eye of the Jailer people will be just, you know, going and trying to do crazy things in this zone. So overall, if we're just going to take this back a second, how will this fit into your gameplay? Well, I'd say it's clearly going to be an important place. You are supposed to go here regularly. You've got your daily quest from Venari, so that's a bit of a start. And I imagine there will be, you know, some main story progression here in the Shadowlands expansion with your Epic Covenant campaigns. I mean, our goal is to push back the Jailer and to gain ground in Torghast that rescue people and eventually take them out. So the Maw will be important. And that means we're likely going to be pushing and pulling with the Jailer in the Maw once we reach maybe breakpoints in our Covenant progression. And then, of course, there's also the area to get um, some anima and freed souls, which are core resources for the Covenant Sanctum system, which uh, actually seems pretty cool. And stay tuned for the Ian interview, because in that, he talks a little bit about the sort of hard cap on player power progression, but a soft cap on other forms of progression. And they've actually implemented that in a really clean way that I like quite a bit. So that was pretty cool. So there's that for your Covenants, but then also you've got reputation to gain with Venari. So that in itself will probably unlock some, you know, cosmetics or quality of life upgrades in the Maw. So there's that going on. Um, I mean, as an example, like there's an area called the Beast Warrens. Uh, now that had a randomly get feared affix. And then Venari had dialogue saying we weren't ready to go there yet. So that's likely some sort of idea where we're maybe reclaiming parts of the Maw. Or maybe we're gaining more power with Venari over time. That would perhaps help us to ignore those affixes and explore cool new parts of it. Almost reminds me of some of the affixes experienced in the Horrific Visions. I think some of which are good and fun. Others are maybe less fun and horrific visions, but it's cool to see them try to add in pieces of that BFA tech wherever it uh, makes sense, and that could work here. Uh, again, for the theme of the Maw, and I think with the Maw, it's a zone where they are very much saying this is its theme. We're going to try to make it as good at being that as is possible, and I think that means it'll be more controversial. I don't think this is going to be a boring zone. I think this is going to be a zone where it's like you just feel stressed and you don't want to be there or you relish the challenge, but I don't think it's going to be some sort of milk toast zone where it's just like boring, right? So I think that's probably the right way for them to go when it comes to making parts of the game that actually do strongly appeal to people. But yeah, certainly if you think about it, right, patches, adding new things to buy here with Stygia, maybe new areas, new enemy types, that would be a pretty good way to keep this place feeling relevant over time that could maybe even tie into some changes or additions they would make with Torghast and its enemies as the patches roll on. So overall, I'd say here, it feels pretty good. It's also a different feeling iteration of a type of zone that we've seen before. It's not as whimsical as Mechagon. It's not as mysterious as the Timeless Isles, but it is vicious and aggressive. It feels more interesting than, say, the Antoran Wastes. I'll certainly say that. A lot better than that place. And uh, hopefully it's, like, tied in well into 9 story progression. So I'd say here, to be quite optimistic... This feels like it could slot very nicely alongside doing more regular feeling content in other zones, and I just like that diversity of content and the options that it seems like Blizz want to give people in the end game of Shadowlands. So, so far, from the Maw, I'm actually pretty impressed, and that's definitely something that I, you know, I'm happy to say, because for a long time, we'd only have the Alpha, we'd had leveling up zones, we didn't really have max level stuff, but uh, now we actually have seen some more of the endgame stuff, and generally, as I see things, I am feeling better and better. There are a few little quirks here and there. I'm going to do a video on my worries on the expansion, as well as the things I'm hyped on uh, in the future, but uh, yeah, suffice to say, I think a lot of things are shaping up pretty good, and the Maw is certainly one of the things that I would count in in the good category. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed this video. Of course, if you want to learn about soul binds and hear a bit about uh, or a bit a, a bit on them from Ian, then uh, sub to the channel. Check out that video that should be going live today, and then stay tuned for uh, your uh, your lore minds to be blown on Sunday because again. Ian really delivered, and it was with my first damn question, which is pretty exciting. So stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. 